Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this U Catholic webinar on the Parables of Mercy with Catholic Distance University. My name is Anna Mitchell. I'm the host and producer of the Sunrise Morning Show, which you can hear each morning on EWTN Radio. And I'd like to start off, if you would, with a prayer. It's from a conversation that St. Faustina, um, a, a saint of mercy, if you will, a, a conversation that St. Faustina had with our Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You have conquered, O Lord, my stony heart with your goodness. In trust and humility, I approach the tribunal of your mercy, where you yourself absolve me by the hand of your representative. O Lord, I feel your grace and your peace, feeling my poor soul. I feel overwhelmed by your mercy, O Lord. You forgive me, which is more than I dared to hope for or could imagine. Your goodness surpasses all my desires. And now, filled with gratitude for so many graces, I invite you to my heart. I wandered like a prodigal child gone astray, but you did not cease to be my father. Increase your mercy toward me, for you see how weak I am. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, as I said, welcome to this U Catholic webinar in conjunction with Catholic Distance University on the Parables of Mercy. Again, my name is Anna Mitchell, and I want to introduce our panelists. Dr. Peter Brown is Academic Dean for Catholic Distance University. He has a BA from Yale and an MA in Theology from Franciscan University in Steubenville. He's worked with Dr. Scott Hahn and has published book reviews and articles and given lectures on scripture and theology. Peter received his doctorate in Biblical Studies at Catholic University of America, which includes advanced studies in Greek and all Biblical languages. He teaches sacred scripture and Biblical languages for CEU. Dr. Brown, welcome. Thanks, Anna. Good to have you here. Dr. Matthew oh, Bunsen. Dr. Matthew Bunsen is faculty chair for Catholic Distance University. He's senior contributor for EWTN and a senior, senior fellow of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. He's the author or co-author of 50 books and was longtime editor up until this year of the Catholic Almanac from our Sunday Visitor, also serving as editor of the Catholic Answer Magazine and senior correspondent for OSB News Weekly. He teaches courses in church history, history and Catholic social teaching for CDU. He's also a very very regular and valued member of the Sunrise Morning Show team. Dr. Bunsen, welcome to the webinar. Great to be with you. You mentioned the most important part last. <laughs> yes, I think so too. Yeah. And uh, certainly not, not, not least, but last year, Dr. Christine Wood is an instructor with Catholic Distance University. She received her PhD in theology from Marquette University and her MA in theology from Franciscan University of Steubenville. Since then, Christine has been lecturing in Systematic and Theology and Ethics at John Paul the Great Catholic University. Christine is currently working towards the publication of her doctoral dissertation entitled, get this, <laughs> The Metaphysics and Intellective Psychology in the Natural Desire for Seeing God, Henri de Lubac, and Neoscholasticism. I don't even know what that means, Dr. <laughs> Clearly, we are in the uh, presence of a lot of greatness here for this webinar. Of course, Dr. Wood teaches theology at CDU. Dr. Wood, thanks for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're going to get started on um, this, this theme of the parables of mercy, which I'm so excited to talk to each of you about. And Dr. Brown, I want to start with you just to kind of get a general overview of what we're going to be discussing tonight. So first of all, what is the purpose of a parable? And... What would be the benefit of Jesus using parables to express the merciful nature of God? That's a really good question. And actually, the, the answer almost depends on what gospel you're looking at. Because Jesus, it seems like, if, if you look at all the gospels carefully, he seems to use his parables a little bit differently in each case. In, in uh, Mark, it's really surprising in the beginning of Mark, he uses parables. It's very surprising. He tells us uh, that parables are actually, in a way, to obscure the truth from unbelievers rather than to reveal it to those who are favorable to his message. And that's sort of surprising, but that's undoubtedly 
um, one aspect of his mission that the um, that, that the purpose of the parables is actually in, in a way uh, paradoxically to separate the wheat from the chaff. Now, in Matthew and Luke, it's it's uh, different because uh, in, in Matthew, I'd say in Luke especially, parables are really meant to uh, to instruct and to teach uh, by means of similitude. Uh, just as we oftentimes, when we're trying to make a point, will illustrate it by a story, uh, our Lord, you know, naturally did did the same thing. He was not the only person to do that, but he, he was someone who's probably the most famous for doing it. Um, in the Old Testament, you did see the prophets doing it occasionally, too. Um, you may remember the story when David was... Uh, af after he committed adultery with Bathsheba, he got confronted with the prophet Nathan, and Nathan told a parable. But the parable, in that case, was meant to instruct uh, David as as to his guilt um, and and the need to to seek out God's mercy. So it's not something that Jesus invented, but but in some ways, he's probably the most famous person parable teller in the world. Yeah, I would definitely yeah. say so. Um, I, I forgot to note, by the way, um, just a couple of notes for those of you who are tuning into this webinar. If you have questions that you are thinking of throughout this webinar, there is a little um, dashboard that you have on your screen. If you go to the questions part of that, you can type in your questions for any of the panelists. You can address it to one or all of them, and um, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can at the end. And also, it's a little bit of an incentive for you to stick around for the entire webinar. It's only going to be about an hour and 15 minutes. We really try to be respectful of your time. Um, if you stick around toward the end, there is the opportunity for you to win some Catholic Distance University swag. <laughs> Who doesn't want CDU swag, right? It's very yeah. exciting. So you're going to have to stick around. I'm not going to tell you how you can get the swag until the end. So a little bit of incentive to stick around. And it's going to be a really interesting conversation tonight. So you really will not be disappointed if you do stick around. Dr. Munson, I want to come to you next. Yeah. Um, because this obviously, this theme of mercy is one that has come up a lot in recent days because Pope Francis has called a year of mercy. And so those right. parables are particularly important to us right now. Uh, they're absolutely vital, and certainly as far as Pope Francis is concerned, and you're you're exactly right. This is the year of mercy, and, and Pope Francis uh, convoked it a special year of mercy, a jubilee year of mercy. He has made mercy one of the pillars of his pontificate, and he uses on a very regular basis some of the most famous of uh, our Lord's parables. Like I think is in particular of uh, the prodigal son. Now, he's building, of course, on especially the writings of uh, Pope St. John Paul II, whose second encyclical, Dives in Misericordia, uh, was itself steeped in the prodigal son. So Francis is uh, not doing something completely original here, but what, he's trying to make a point, uh, and that is that the need for mercy in the world today. And for Francis, that connection of mercy uh, ties very closely to another word that he likes to use, and that's encounter, that we see in these parables, uh, the stories, uh, short or long, aphoristic or narrative, that have an encounter part to them. In other words, uh, through these mercy parables, you have an encounter, not just with mercy, but in the teller of the parables, and that, of course, is uh, of Jesus Christ. So Francis wants us to have this encounter with Christ, and the way he's doing it is to emphasize uh, the great parables of mercy that our Lord told as a way of helping to introduce people uh, to the, the great mercy that he was bringing. Mm -hmm. um, we actually, I'm going to get to one question here because it's already posed. What is the origin of the word parable, Dr. Bunsen? Well, we have the, the Greek etymology, uh, and I'll, I'll defer for the more complete answer to uh, <laughs> Pete, because he's an expert in biblical languages. But one of the, the fun things about the, the etymological origins of, of the word is the Greek meaning side by side. And we can see how in parables, uh, we're seeing sort of two sides. We're seeing a juxtaposition of, of mercy, of injustice, of those who are unmerciful, those who need mercy. And it's also a way of expressing a side-by-side -side relationship that occurs in so many of the parables. We think of the, the 
Good Samaritan, for example, of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. So there's always a relationship. And, and we can talk later about sort of a Trinitarian quality to parables as well. So we're seeing actually side by side by side. But I'll, I'll let Pete also uh, delve a little more deeply into the, the Hebrew origins as well. Well, yeah, so it, it, the notion of parable probably um, is a kind of a Greek version of the Jewish style of telling stories called the Mishal. The Mishal is a little hard to translate into English. It sort of means like story, but it also has a force of, of kind of uh, like, like a riddle almost. So its meaning is not always entirely clear. And um, it, it's one of those things that, that kind of is meant to be a, a pebble in your oyster shell to, to kind of uh, get you thinking a lot and wrestling with it. Because in some ways, the, the truth, uh, the, the actual teaching message is not always entirely obvious. And just as Matthew was saying, there's a lot of side by side, you know, idea of parables, usually the parable, like one thing will stand for something else, but it's not always clear what that thing is meant to stand for. And in fact, many of the parables, it seems like the elements of the parable, for instance, the, the, the wicked tenants, uh, you, you know, the parable, of the wicked tenants where, where, uh, the, Lord keeps sending uh, different people to collect uh, the, the money that he's owed. Who do those wicked tenants represent? Um, they could represent the old corrupt leadership of, of old Israel. They could represent you and me um, not really ready for the Lord's return um, and needing to repent before that happens. So in other words, it could be a cautionary warning for us as well. So there's, there's no set way of interpreting them. And, and that's, why they have this this riddle quality to them almost? Well, okay, gonna, so, the, yeah, but, go sorry. I was going to say that uh, the, the, to pick up on something that Pete just said, there there is this riddle quality to it. But there's also uh, it, it has been thought that for the listener uh, in the ancient world, uh, especially the the Hebrew world, the Jewish world, the, the the audience, the immediate audience of our Lord's parables, they would have understood so many of the images. Uh, the Samaritan, for example, was a recurring theme in the, the parables of mercy. These were not particularly popular people, uh, certainly in Galilee, and we can talk more about that. So the imagery the, would have been very vivid, but our Lord would have been using very precise images that would have really resonated quite well. People would have picked up on those. But then he also has the, the, the reversals that happen in so many of these. I, I think, for example, of the rich man and Lazarus, uh, that he who was first ends up uh, quite last uh, in, in this particular parable. So there's the irony. But then people would have also found parables probably very funny. Uh, we think of the, the, the judge with the widow uh, who pesters him until he relents. That's right. That's something that uh, people can understand today. Uh, but back yeah. then, especially, this is an audience that would have picked up on these, especially right. given that this is such an oral culture, such a, a culture of language and linguistic traditions. The, the force of the Greek in that is not even so much when the judge is complaining about the widow. And Matthew is referring to the uh, the parable in Luke 18 with the uh, the, the parable of the. Of the uh, the unjust judge, but but he says that, that if this woman doesn't keep stop coming and blackening my eye, literally, yes. um, <laughs> then uh, so so eventually he has to uh, he has to relent and let her have what she wants. But of course, the, the the idea there is is perseverance in prayer. I think right. So that, yeah. that that one's maybe a little bit more clear. And I think in some ways Luke's parables sometimes um, are are more clear. Um, than some of the other parables that you see, like in uh, Mark, for instance. Believe it or not, the parable of the sower, everyone thinks they understand that parable. And one of the first things I do usually lecturing is that that's actually a really, really hard parable to interpret because uh, what exactly is, is, is going on there uh, with, with these seeds being sown? Um, is, is it about us and our repentance or... Is it really more just about how the kingdom is going to come, despite the fact that most of the seeds that the sower is sowing um, seem not to be growing? Um, that, that nevertheless, uh, God is strong enough and the word is strong enough that, that, that God will bring it to fruition. Um, so in other words, if you, if you check the commentaries on that, you'll find that there, there's many, many interpretations of that seemingly simple parable. That's actually a really hard one to interpret. Some of the really seemingly easy ones are actually quite difficult. 
Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Dr. Wood, I want to let you jump in here now. So we're going to be talking a lot about the um, parables in Luke. I know that, that most of the parables of mercy are in Luke, and I want to start with the stories that are actually generally known as the parables of mercy, and those would be um, the ones found in Luke 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. Um, first of all, can you just give us an overview of those three parables, and how do they build on one another? Sure. Well, I'm just turning to that right now. I'm a systematic theologian, not a theologian. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah, so the parable of the lost sheep. System, put them in a system for us, would you then? <laughs> I need time to do that. Yeah, so the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. Um, well, I, I <laughs> put them into a systematic order. Um, well, I think it's got to do with the kingdom of God and going out to... Um, that God's going out to 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 bring salvation to all of us, not not just um, not just the righteous, but even the unrighteous. That God wants to go out and and call back those sinners to repentance too. And you see that most fully in the parable of of the prodigal son, where you have the two sons who both well, one seems as though he's righteous and the other one unrighteous, but in fact they're both unrighteous in a certain sense and so um, I think it's a call to repentance for all of us but also shows the mercy of God how he's willing to go um, go to extreme measures to show the mercy show his own mercy to bring us to that um, to to the kingdom of God and everlasting life so there's a very basic systematic <laughs> line um, yeah, maybe Pete or or Matthew could shed more light on the more biblical um, well, I, picture I, of the text. I, I, I've always wondered, you know, about about that because when I I used to um, back in another life, I used to field uh, theology questions uh, when I was a student intern at Catholics United for the Faith, and one one question that I got was. Well, you know, my pastor says, you know, based on what the Good Shepherd does in in, uh, in, in uh, Luke 15, where he leaves the 99 behind and searches for the one, you know, he's basically, you know, ignoring his whole flock and going out and trying to find the one person, you know, out in the street corner who really needs help and stuff. And, and you know, it, it seems a little crazy to me. And, it, well, and I kind of respectfully say, you know, I don't know if that's exactly what the point of the parable is, because in fact, uh, a true shepherd probably would not leave behind 99 sheep to find the one. And that's in some ways the point of the parable, right? In other words, it's it, it sort of uh, carries the idea of love and concern and compassion of the heavenly father to kind of a ridiculous extreme like god loves us and wants us back more than than our sort of human uh systems or our human minds can really fathom and so that therefore he would do sort of nutty things like leaving 99 sheep behind to fend for themselves you know to, to search for one when in reality you know no serious shepherd would would probably do that and, and likewise you know no woman would would you know have a have a party because she found a coin in her sofa. I mean, that's it's great to find a coin in your sofa, Speak but it's for yourself, Doctor Brown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it kind of shows you that that you know how how much rejoicing there is over these seemingly little things, like you know mm. one person repenting over a small sin. That you know there, there's there's a massive rejoicing in, in heaven because God God's love in some ways just just uh, it, it's, it's almost insane. It it goes it goes further than you know, human limits. And I think, I that's how kind of I understand the point of it. So let me jump in because I have a, there's one thing about the, the story of the lost sheep that I think is lost on us today because not many of us have experience in shepherding, right? I mean, yeah. and so, um, you know, <laughs> oh, listeners, oh, okay. listen, oh, really? Well, I'm going to ask shepherd, you right? about that. <laughs> I, was an, I was an agricultural scientist, so I have shepherded yeah. sheep. <laughs> you about that in just a second then dr wood but the, I, I just want to say that you know listeners of the morning show will will recognize this because i bring it up every time that that story comes up in the daily readings 
um, my, my venerable former co-host, Matt Swain, um, used to liken it to doing laundry and, and would say, what person, when carrying clothes in their arms, would not risk the entire pile of laundry yeah, yeah, yeah. for the one <laughs> sock that fell on the floor? That's a, that's would you say that's a good way to, yeah. to, 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 yeah. to look yeah. at that? But yeah. Dr. Wood, tell me, okay, so look at this from the, uh, from the perspective of, of a <laughs> shepherd. Tell us about this. Well, something that pops immediately into mind is when one sheep goes astray, the others tend to lean that way and may even follow. So it's, mm. I think that is very um, pertinent to this, that if, if one of Christ's fold goes astray, it's quite often an indication that many others will start going down that track too. So you can see why Jesus would want to go out and bring that one back for the sake of the 99. Uh, Not only for that one, him, him or herself, but also for the, for the sake of the 99. And of course, the 99 are going to rejoice even more. Not just that that one's brought back, but they're all safe. No, you disagree with my interpretation. It's more of a rational love rather than an irrational one. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> I can write it. I don't know. I could be wrong. <laughs> no, it's it's a, yeah. 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 Well, the other way, I sort of to, to take both of those ideas. The first, I suppose you could throw a party with one drachma at the time, but I, I defy <laughs> our resources to do so, especially today. But. Uh, one of the things about the, the lost sheep that uh, really does emerge out of that story, both the lost sheep and the, the, the lost coin, is the significance of not so much what the shepherd is doing, but the significance of the one sheep to the shepherd. Uh, in the sense that here we have in a parable, uh, a perfect illustration of what the church teaches about the dignity of the human person made in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, worth pursuing, worth going out uh, to find, to bring back. And I'm, I'm always reminded of the, the great uh, dictum of uh, Catherine of Siena, who made the observation that one saved soul is actually the most beautiful thing in the whole of the universe. And you can see that with, with the sheep, uh, that as far as a shepherd is concerned, uh, rescuing this sheep is worth everything. And of course, we have our Lord talking about rescuing animals on the Sabbath in violation of what then was the law. Uh, but then we have to look also the wider context of some of this. Uh, what do we read just before the, these parables that Jesus became known for dining with sinners? So he was already opening the door uh, to his willingness to go out uh, to find the sinner, to bring them back, which also brings us to, to Francis with his call for us to go out uh, to bring Christ out into the world. And if that means going out to find the lost coin, the lost sheep, whatever image we want to use, I think that's very consonant with what Francis is telling us. And I want to move on to, to the prodigal son here, which is uh, contained in those three parables of mercy in Luke chapter 15. Um, Dr. Brown, do you think that the name prodigal son is perhaps not the greatest of titles for this right. parable? I mean, it seems yeah. to make you believe that this is more about the child than about the father. Well, right. I mean, it, you you could uh, call it the parable of the uh, the forgiving father. And, and actually, um, I would think that there's even a strong case could be made that it could be called the parable of the elder brother because... Really, the uh, the envy of the elder brother at the end is in some way meant to kind of uh, to, to, to cap off the, the, the idea. The idea of mercy, of course, in this point in Luke's gospel uh, and in the other parables is pretty well established. But now we're starting to deal with the other aspect of mercy, and that's the, the jealousy and the envy in some cases that it causes of people who are, you know, the incumbent ones in the family who didn't go astray uh, and didn't feel like they needed the mercy. And the other person that Johnny come lately is coming back and is receiving this great party. And the father's falling all over himself is, is running down the road, halfway down the road to meet him as, as the, 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 the story goes. And he has a really hard time coming to terms with that. And, um, it, it, on a really, really kind of deep historical level, you almost could see this as being a parable about 
the tension in the early church between the Jewish believers in Jesus who felt like they had sort of been in the family of Abraham all the time and these kind of Johnny-come-lately Gentiles who had been going astray, you know, if you look at them collectively for centuries, if not millennia, and now all of a sudden uh, are, are not only coming into the church and coming, you know, back to the Father, so to speak, but they're actually becoming uh, more and more numerous than, than the sort of the elder brother, Jewish brethren, and that we know caused a lot of tension just looking at the evidence from the letters of Paul and elsewhere in the book of Acts. And so, um, and you, you actually see a shorter version of this parable in, in Matthew as well, uh, where, where you have the, the two brothers, the one brother who says, yeah, y'all do what you say, Father, and he goes out, he doesn't do it, and then the other one says, uh, uh, no, I won't do it, but then he does do it, and then, then you, you, you kind of see that, that whole theme of reversal there, and that's kind of what's going on in, in one sense in the parable of prodigal son, or as I often call it, maybe the parable of the elder brother. Dr. Benson, what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, well, as I was saying, Pope John Paul II really focused on on this particular parable in Dives and Misericordia. And uh, what's wonderful about this particular parable, and this is true about a lot of parables, is that you could actually name it after any one of the three. You could name it the prodigal of the, the, the mm -hmm. son, the, the younger son, prodigal of the older son, but especially prodigal the father of the two sons, right? It is the father uh, who seems to me to be one of the, the, the central focus of the story in a way, because he is the one uh, who gives his son permission to take uh, what really he has no right to uh, long before he's entitled to it. It is the father who is also, we, we read in this parable, what is he doing? He's always scanning the horizon. He's looking for his son, so he never stopped looking and waiting and hoping that his son would come back. And it's that relationship, a series of relationships in this parable, um, as, as Pete points out, it could very well be the, the parable of the, the elder son, the one who's feeling rather unhappy about this set of circumstances, but the father's always pivoting between the younger and the, and the elder son, asking the younger son uh, to come back to his senses, and he does, and he, he's exuberant with joy, but then he asks the elder son, celebrate this, where is your mercy? Uh, and, and then there's that, the, the, the phrase that the, the elder son uses, this son of yours, and yet his father reminds him, this brother of yours. Yeah. And asking him to remember who this person is. And so I, I love to focus more on the father in this, uh, in the way that we can focus on our Lord, in the way that we can focus on, on God uh, bringing us mercy and always looking out for us to come back. Okay, Dr. Wood, I want to, now that I know that you have, you know, farm experience, <laughs> agriculture experience, let's talk a little bit about these pigs that the prodigal son uh, is with. And how does that... Um, <laughs> I've had a very good go for it, right? Yeah, I figured you did. So, what, I mean... It just goes to show just how low he was. Can you explain exactly how deep in the gutter he was if he's, you know, salivating over what the pigs are eating? <laughs> sure. Well, my experience with pigs is they are extremely stinky and very loud in their squealing. So it's, it's almost, well, it could be like a picture of hell. <laughs> So just on that sensitive level, it's it's a hor well for me it was a horrible experience. Um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> <in terms of, laughs> that's right, you know that's right. The sanitized version of pigs is very nice, um, but yeah, in terms of the biblical context, of course, pigs were were deemed to be unclean in the Jewish uh, tradition and um, under Torah. So this was. Um, for the, the Jewish listeners in Jesus' day, this was a horrible, horrible situation that this man had fallen to such such low levels that he's actually living amongst the swine now, the most unclean, and not only um, can't feed himself, but he has to eat the scraps that's left over from the unclean animals. 
and so it's it's a really bad situation of deprivation and being so far from God. So this this shows the distance that he has has um, put between himself and his loving Father, who represents God, and that's what sin does to us. Sin separates us from the love of the Father. Not that God stops loving us. But we stop loving him and we turn away from him and we turn turn towards um, sin and uncleanness. Yeah, I mean, no matter how much I love my daughter, it's very hard for me to be around her when she has a dirty diaper. <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's repulsive, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What do you think this parable Dr. Wood tells us about the, the necessity of humility um, in, in this whole story of the merciful father? Yeah, well, you see humility in both the father and the repentant son, even though it doesn't say that the son humbles himself explicitly, but he does come back to the to his father's house and just wants to be open. So there's, there's a, an attitude of humility. Um, and there's the call to humility of the older son, but he, he doesn't respond in that way. Um, I think it's very appropriate for our moral lives to hear this sort of um, uh, a call to humility in recognizing our own sinfulness and the need to turn back to God, that we actually can't overcome that divide that this uh, prodigal son has set between himself and his father. Um, so we have to recognize the state that sin uh, brings us to and in humility, humility comes from the Latin of meaning um, earth, humus. So turning down towards the earth and, and um, recognizing our lowly state. And so it's it's the father who has to come out of his house, so to speak, runs to the son to draw him up. And that's and that's that's the sense of the incarnation, isn't it? That God, God the Son, comes from heaven to dwell with us. And you see the the. The utter humility there in the sun, taking on human flesh in order to come down to sinful humanity represented in, in the prodigal son and to draw us back up to the father's house. And, and I, oh, go ahead. I also see a connection between this prodigal son parable and the other two parables, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, that um, you see in those first two parables that the 99 rejoice and then the woman goes to rejoice and sort of have a party with her friends and neighbours that she has recovered her lost coin. But in the prodigal son parable, the older son doesn't respond in that positive way. And so you see what um, the first two parables are looking at an, an animal that's lost and then a coin that's lost. And now in the third parable, Jesus is saying, now these things represent my children, the prodigal son and and the um, unrighteous older brother. So he moves, he, he sort of sets up for the prodigal son parable with the first two parables to show um, what's really at stake here. What's at stake is the kingdom of heaven and your righteousness or unrighteousness and the call to repentance of both to come to the Father's house. And um, you can apply that today, um, in, well, in every age really, are we who are in the church like the righteous son or the unrighteous son? And if we're like the righteous son, are we? <laughs> is our righteousness self-righteousness or is it... Um, a, a righteousness that stems from the mercy of God. So we want to be like the woman who goes searching for the for the coin or the shepherd who goes out to seek the lost sheep. Yeah, and Dr. Bunsen, I mean, don't you think oftentimes we respond like that elder brother? I mean, the self-righteousness, when we as a church, though we proclaim mercy, we often have a hard time accepting it when other people who don't seem so deserving get it. Exactly. Uh, and we, uh, we greet their success, we greet their return uh, with ingratitude, uh, that we ourselves lack uh, the humility, uh, as Dr. Wood wonderfully pointed out, uh, to celebrate their return and, and also to 
take that as an opportunity to look at ourselves and say, he, I may not have been wallowing with the pigs, but it's pretty clear that the, the elder son has a number of issues himself uh, and pent up rage, probably long simmering frustration that his brother had, had gone away. In a way, it's the worst of both worlds for the older brother because his, his younger brother had squandered part of the portion that he probably saw rightfully coming to him, went off, had a lot of fun, and still gets to come back uh, into the loving embrace of the father. So it, he saw this from a personal standpoint of, of selfishness rather than welcoming him back into the family, which is now stronger for his return uh, in, in the same way that the, the woman is richer for the return of her drachma and the, the, the flock is stronger for the return of the lost sheep. But there's also the, the one other image that's worth uh, teasing out with the, the prodigal son, and that's distance. Uh, Dr. Wood uh, said it perfectly when she made the observation about the, the incarnation of, of God coming down. In this parable, we have this, the, the younger son going away, so moving, there's, there's a sense of movement, there's a distance, and the farther he moves away from the family, from his house, the, the house of God, the worse the situation becomes. And finally, he realizes that he has to come back to the house, and there's a closing of distance again. Uh, so it's that movement uh, that we're all called to make, that when we have moved away, moved out of the house, into situations uh, where we know in our heart uh, we shouldn't be. There's one place that we can always go, and, and that's back to the flock, and that's certainly back to the Father's house. Um, Dr. Brown, there's a question uh, that, that one of our viewers have posed, um, asking if we could dive in a bit to the fact that the Father talking to the elder son says, what is mine has always been yours. What is mine has always been yours. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's probably covenantal language that gets back to the idea that, that you know, at, at of course, a human family, uh, there's the notion of inheritance, and the notion of inheritance is really very much at the cornerstone of the idea of God's people and their heavenly father, that, the, you know, the whole idea of salvation is in some way, you know, not so much to be pulled out of here, but to receive our inheritance, which is this idea of a, you know, restored creation and uh, a new heaven and a new earth. And that's what we're all in line to receive um, when we're part of the victory party. And, and that's, that's kind of the idea there, this, this idea of uh, possessions and inheritance we see it a lot developed in Paul, but it's but it's a very important idea in in Luke also um, that that you know God owns everything and and He's ultimately planning to share it with His uh, with His children and you I think see that reflected in this parable as well. Yeah, um, Dr. Benson, I want to uh, move on to another story that we see in the Gospel of Luke, and I'm wondering if you could. Um, just dive a little deeper into the importance of humility in our, as humans, acceptance of God's mercy, as we see in the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Yeah, well, the, we're seeing again the, the, the imagery that Luke is trying to impart about our Lord's teachings on not just pride and lack of humility, but also hypocrisy, which is one of the things that I think our Lord is um, always talking about. Our, our Lord was willing to go out and meet tax collectors uh, who were considered a pariah in their era, in, in the time. Think of St. Matthew and the call of St. Matthew. The, the fact that our Lord was willing to dine with these people uh, was enough, I think, to offend all segments of the population. And so a parable like this gives him the opportunity uh, to drive home uh, the fact that we have to go to where the sinners are. And the Pharisees, of course, were a constant foil uh, for our Lord in his parables. And uh, that's a positioning. Uh, that hypocrisy with the tax collector, I think, was, was exactly the kind of imagery that our Lord was able to use with such great success. And in, um, in Luke chapter 18, for those of you following along at home in your Bible, 
um, before he tells this parable, uh, Dr. Brown, it says that um, that he did this so that they could, to the effect that they ought to always to pray and not lose heart. Exactly. Um, Luke's gospel is really the gospel of prayer. Um, there are several really key themes that stand out in Luke, and one of them is prayer. It's not that you don't see prayer in the other Gospels, but you see a lot more of it in Luke. Uh, Jesus prays before he selects his disciples in Luke. Uh, Jesus, as we know, is seen praying in the garden. There are many, many instances like in between his teachings that he's found praying. Um, he counsels his disciples to pray. Uh, there's a lot of prayer in the very beginning part of Luke's gospel as well, uh, when Zechariah is praying, uh, when, when he receives his visitation from the angel Gabriel, uh, we see prayer in, uh, at, uh, let's see, at the, at the time, uh, in, in early, early on as well, uh, when they go to the temple to present Jesus, there's, there's the woman, uh, praying Anna, the daughter of Fanuel. So in other words, little random details like that, but, but really serve to underscore a theme. And of course, many of the parables also are about prayer, uh, not only the importance of prayer, but the importance of perseverance in prayer. And this, several of these come out in, in this one. And I think it's specifically the, the parable of the, uh, the, the widow and the unjust judge. Is, is, as well, um, is, is really one that stands out in my mind um, as being about that. But I think there's lots of other examples as well of that. And in the use of the phrase repeatedly in this uh, parable of humbled, uh, that the this person humbled himself in prayer, uh, we're seeing the, the imagery of repentance, but also what we do after we repent, uh, that we set aside our pride, that we do make humble obeisance to God and beg his forgiveness for our sins. And again, that juxtaposition, that reversal that we see in uh, so many of the parables of the, the Pharisee who is proud uh, in his conceit uh, and the, the tax collector, the sinner uh, who humbles himself before the Lord. So again, our, our Lord making the point that those who repent uh, are the ones to be embraced, uh, for they recognize their failings. Even if they're tax collectors. Yeah, and the, well, there's a sort of false kind of uh, of repentance too that I think is showcased in that parable as well, because yeah. the Pharisee, in his own sort of way, does repent. He is grateful to God. He says, "Thank you for not making me like this tax collector," which is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not exactly that sort of you know gratitude. It's it's in its own way, but it, it doesn't quite get to the uh, the notion of repentance. I think in in in, in the way that uh, uh, Jesus really wants to, to teach it, and I think you know that is exactly the kind of um, repentance that that all of us need, because I think almost every one of us, in one one point of our life or another, could could see ourselves. Uh, you know, looking on someone else doing something that, you know, seems horrible. We can never picture ourselves doing that. And, you know, we, we, we might thank God that we're not like that person, but, in, you know, in a way, um, we don't know what we would have done if we had been similarly tested. You know, there's a lot of things we don't know about um, that, that person. And I think it's, um, it's you know, it, it's definitely not a call to pride. It's a call to humility. I think it's really interesting when you look at the attitude of the Pharisee and his prayer, he's looking around at the others in the temple, in particular the tax collector, and you see that he's comparing himself with these others who he calls sinners, basically. And so it's really easy to like, look at them at a, as a standard and say, well, I'm a little bit better than them, and I'm doing pretty well. Whereas the attitude of the... Um, the tax collector is not to look around him and compare himself with others, other human beings who are sinners, but he looks to heaven and he sees the great distance between himself and heaven and hence he repents. He recognizes his sinful state and really that's what we're all called to do, isn't it? We don't look to others and say, well, I'm tracking pretty well in this righteousness stuff. Um, but rather we look to Christ and we see that we are... Falling short often, and um, 
God's grace, don't we? So you see there, even with the the Pharisee, he says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. And that's that's the typical sort of Pelagian attitude, isn't it? Where I'm going to work my way to heaven and I'm going to get there by my own strength. But the tax collector doesn't do that. And he recognizes the gift of God and his and that is his mercy to draw him out of the sinfulness that he can't get out of himself. And the, the, the Pharisee is also hiding behind uh, what he does. Uh, he mentions, as, as Christine noted, uh, that I tithe, I fast. These are the most minimum bare requirements, uh, and yet he boasts of doing them. But there's, there's no heart there. There's no love there. Uh, there's no desire uh, to do true repentance. So he's simply ticking off boxes of stuff that he's supposed to do. Uh, and having done them, he's satisfied that he is pure. And that's that's a pattern I think a lot of people, including, except for me, of course, don't, a lot of people... <laughs> A lot of people fall into it, though, right? We, we, you know, I go to mass every Sunday. Um, I, 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 I do my, my, you know, weekly donation to the parish. Um, you know, I, I dot all the I's and I cross all the T's. Therefore, you know, what, what more am I supposed to do? I mean, <laughs> so that, that, that kind of thing. So it becomes, in a way, you know, something you kind of hide behind rather than something that, you know, in, in a way, almost. That doesn't work for you as well that way because you're you're not seeing it as a gift so much as you're seeing it as a um, almost like a badge of honor or something. Yeah, so um, I, that's an easy that's an easy trap to fall into. I think I think that that uh, actually I'll tell you one time it was it was great. I went to confession once and for, for my penance I I had to go repeat the line of the the, the publican and. and the, the priest told me to beat your breast, just just like the publican did, and, and then say, say what the publican uh, does. And so it's a, it's very powerful in a way. I mean that that was one that kind of stuck with me more than the three Our Fathers and the three Hail Marys that I usually get. So um, that, it was it was it was a good it was a good penance. Hmm. Well, well, let's pivot a little bit here um, to talk about the story of the Good Samaritan. And Dr. Bunsen, this is a different aspect of mercy that Jesus is revealing to us through this story. Uh, it is. It is uh, the fact that we cannot simply stand by, uh, that we are impelled, uh, that if we are to be merciful, uh, we have to orient ourselves to acts of mercy, uh, to be merciful as the Father is merciful. And that also brings uh, what for many, I, even today, uh, is a very troubling question of who is my neighbor. Uh, what constitutes my neighbor? Uh, is, is it the people that I like? Is it the people that I, I choose to consider my neighbor? Or is it the person that I find bleeding on the side of the road? And we read every day stories of people who will step over dying people, people who've been mugged or, or stabbed on, on a subway or beaten, uh, and they, they stand and do nothing. Uh, who is our neighbor? And it, it, I think it's a profound question uh, because it's tied so intimately to who we're called to be as followers of Christ. Yeah, and, and Dr. Wood, I want to kind of jump on that point about who is my neighbor. I mean, this is all coming in the context of a lawyer standing up and asking Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And, you know, Jesus goes on to talk about this, of course, uh, again, for those following along, this is Luke chapter 10. Um, and, and, and so Jesus says, you know, what is law? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And um, and then he asks, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the story. This is what we have to do to inherit eternal life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to go out. We have to go out beyond the pews of the church. And <laughs> what? Take Jesus. I know it's hard, isn't it? We're demanding this gospel. Yeah. So it's not just about going to mass on Sundays and worshiping, worshiping God there in mass and ticking that box. But we actually have to then go out and evangelize. But also we evangelize not 
prime, not just by proclaiming the gospel, but um, by doing good actions to people, charitable works or the spiritual and corporal works of mercy, which we often don't talk and talk about um, anymore, unfortunately. But we need to, and I think this year of mercy helps us to recall those um, spiritual and corporal works of mercy. And we see this particularly if you look at this parable of the Good Samaritan in light of Christ. Christ is the Good Samaritan. He is the one who who goes out and saves fallen Adam. So some of the church fathers understood this parable in this way, that, that the man who is beaten and robbed and left to die is, is fallen Adam in his sinful state. And um, it is Jesus Christ who goes to, to collect or pick up um, Adam and tend his wounds, take him to, to an inn representing the church, and he goes away and then he will come back later and um, and pay all of the debts that are owed to the innkeeper. So you see that allegorical understanding of the parable there. And so, again, we can look to Christ, who is the one who goes out and shows mercy and, um, and heals us. And in so many of these parables, uh, even the lost sheep, uh, there's that cultural subtext of, of going out, of putting yourself at risk. Uh, a shepherd, uh, there are good reasons why you have a staff, because sometimes you need that staff uh, to beat off wild animals that are trying to run off with your sheep. But you're putting yourself very much at risk. Uh, in other words, to put it in, in cultural parlance for today, you're definitely going out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And... Uh, to find the, the lost sheep, uh, to care for the man on the side of the road, it requires a deep commitment. Uh, it, it's more than simply fasting and paying your tithe. It's truly emulating, as, as Christine notes, uh, our Lord in this. And our, our Lord did this unto death on the cross for us. And it, we're called to do the same thing, uh, to put ourselves out there uh, on behalf of others, and at the root of so many of these parables, yes, is mercy, but deeper than that is love. And Dr. Brown, what, can you just tell us a little bit about the significance of the fact that it is a Samaritan man yeah. who I'm is doing the saving? Yeah, yeah I, I, I was going to, so the one problem I have with, with understanding the, the Good Samaritan as Jesus is that that interpretation misses how profoundly scandalous the idea of a Samaritan, a good Samaritan, would be. Um, one of my all-time favorite homilies uh, is, is a priest that decided on, on the pulpit after reading this gospel reading to, to retell the homily in the way that Jesus would have told it today. So basically, <laughs> he, he, he said that So there was this accident on the road and this, this kid was... This this uh, motorist was was dying. He was bleeding to death, and and, and a priest, you know, was on his way to, to give last rites to somebody, and, and he didn't stop. And and then the bishop went along, and you know, he had to get to a bishop's conference, so he didn't have time to stop either. And so finally, this third person pulled up, and they were the executive director of Planned Parenthood, and they pulled the man in. They rescued him. They ran him to the hospital. They paid his hospital bill. They, they hung out with them, and, and they even picked up the cab fare on the way home, and so which man went away justified. And I, I told my friend this. He said, that's scandalous. I said, that's exactly the point. Yeah, I mean, wow. that, 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 you know, um, Jesus is celebrating somebody who he knew in his immediate culture would have absolutely zero sympathy with the listening audience. And this is the, the idea that a Samaritan could, in some manner of speaking, outperform um, in, in the moral realm, uh, a, a, a Levite and a priest, um, it, you know, is is something that is is just horror. You know, it would just cause horror in the in the in the ears of his audience. And in some ways, I, the reason I like that 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 homily so well is it really brought home how you would have to tell it today to make to to, to get that point across. Um, that that there, there's there's such a um, a profoundly subversive aspect to this parable as well. That, that yes, there is the idea of getting outside your comfort zone, that yes, there's the idea of corporal works of mercy, that's all there, but 
who's doing it is is as significant in some ways as what he's doing. Well, I don't know, Dr. Wood, what do you think? That I, Jesus may as well have been a Samaritan in some instances during the Gospels, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, John's Gospel uh, casts the Samaritans in a favorable light. So, um, yeah, I, I'm sure the Samaritans claimed him as their own. Um, at least in John's gospel. Uh, <laughs> but I think maybe Dr. Brown might be able to shed some light on this as well. The, the Samaritans have a long history going all the way back to um, the fall of the, the northern kingdom of Israel. And um, so they have some connection to, to Torah and, um, and Abraham and Moses. Um, so you could talk about it under that aspect as well, that Jesus is, is has come not only for the Jewish people, but for all 12 tribes of Israel and the right. Gentiles as well. So it's right. um, trying to recall in the minds of his Jewish hearers that he's here to gather in all 12 tribes of Israel as the Messiah's role is meant to be. Right. The Samaritans are connected to those lost 10 tribes. And there's yeah, the... Uh, definitely. The, the, the vivid imagery that we have in other par parables and sort of tie into this, that we have this Samaritan who's this outcast. Our Lord also uses lepers uh, in in the, the parable of Lazarus, for example. This is somebody who's in such a lowly state that, it, as he puts it, uh, dogs were licking his sores. Right, right. And this is about as low as you can possibly <laughs> get. And yet, yeah. here are the ones who are not just worth saving, uh, but are are saved and ultimately find a, a great spiritual reward in their suffering. So we're seeing here uh, what, what John Paul II always taught about the school of the cross, uh, uh, that in, there is meaning to this suffering. Uh, at a time, certainly in the ancient world, uh, when suffering was so commonplace that everyone saw the dead and the dying in similar conditions all around them, uh, and there was something radically revolutionarily new uh, in, in what our Lord was calling on them to do. Uh, today, we have a, a better understanding of suffering, and yet here we, we are still grappling with the imagery of suffering in our own lives and the deeper meaning of suffering and trying to find meaning in that suffering. Okay, I wish that we could continue talking about this, but there are still a few more parables that we have to get to, and we've only got like 15 more minutes to talk, and I haven't even gotten to any of the questions from, from viewers either. So um, we're going to move on here to, to Luke chapter 16, and um, talking about the story of, of the dishonest steward. And Dr. Brown, I'll start off with you. Um, I'm wondering if you could just reflect on the fact that, you know, while God is merciful, his mercy is linked to justice, is it not? Uh, we'd certainly like to think so, but but this parable, <laughs> uh, you know, sort of, sort of uh, stretches that concept a little bit, right? Because yeah. you have this this uh, man who's in charge of managing the, the Lord's accounts, and I, I don't think the. Uh, by, by the way, that one of the little plays on words here that causes a little bit of interpretive problems is the is the word master. And the word Lord actually have the same word in Greek. And so it's a little hard to tell sometimes whether master is being referred to or Lord. So, for instance, um, in verse 8, when it says the master praised the wicked household manager, it could be the Lord praised the wicked household manager referring to Jesus. Um, but, but that's probably not how you take it. But that has caused a lot of confusion alone. But nevertheless, even if you don't interpret that verse that way, um, Jesus does seem to be praising um, what this dishonest steward did with the master's account. And I, and I think that's one of the things that really has, you know, kind of become a Charlie horse between the ears in some ways with this parable. Like what, what in the world is, uh, is going on uh, in, in, in there with, um, with praising somebody for, for their punitively dishonest action? Is it not dishonest? Um, is is it good in spite of being dishonest? Is it you know what's going on there exactly? I, I'm just going to throw the question out. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm hoping you all tell me because I don't know that. Who wants it? Yeah, uh, Doctor Wood. 
<laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I'm no expert, but um, from my basic reading, uh, has it got something to do with the dishonest steward adding a certain percentage onto the money that he's collecting from from people? So when right. he's, he's um, well, he's discharged for his dishonesty. So perhaps it was an exorbitant amount that he was charging, um, but it was still permitted um, within the in that culture to add a little percentage on. And so he was discharged for being dishonest for that, for going too far, perhaps. And then when he, after he was discharged, he took his percentage off, and he yeah. just charged what. Yes. What the um, yeah. master? Yeah. That, that, that is one that is one way of, of, of dealing with the, um, the the problem of the dishonesty. Like the dishonesty really may be only in part of the um, the parable. It may have only been before the visitation of the master, which is um, I, I think which, which is actually what the parable is really about in terms of what we're supposed to be doing in terms of the visitation of the Lord. The visitation of the master is of course analogous to preparing for the visitation of the Lord. Um, so in, in that reading, and that, that actually does resolve one of the problems that, um, that, 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 that the dishonesty is, is only seen in the beginning. And so, you know, the, the, the mass, the, uh, sorry, the, uh, manager, uh, or the steward does well when he basically cuts his own percentage out of, of the, uh, the, the amounts collected, um, of course, the, the amount percentage was would, would be enormous if, if that were the case because he's cutting down the, the debts to around half of, of, of what they were. So right. um, we, we can't totally be, be uh, it, it, you know eliminate the suspicion that, that maybe the, uh, the the master is in some way losing some of the money that he's owed as well um, in, in, in this. Um, yeah. So do you have any thoughts on it, Matt? Uh, yeah, I do. Um... In, in this chapter, if we hop, I think, to uh, verse 12, and, and our Lord says, And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And then in the very next verse, we go back to the Pharisees, and it says, Who were lovers of money. Right. You are those who justify yourselves before men, he says, but God knows your heart. And here's one of the, the most famous lines uh, from uh, all of the parables that you, you cannot serve two masters. And I think that that's increasingly clear here that the, the tortured ends to which you have to go in order to try to serve two masters uh, becomes very clear to me in the, in the parable. And you have the, the Pharisees then who are obsessed with, uh, with the, the rules of the law, uh, and are at the same time are obsessed with money and justifying themselves. Uh, but God always knows what's in our hearts and what we have truly done. Right, and and along those lines, uh, Luke's gospel is is famous for its emphasis, among other things. We talked about prayer. We talked about repentance. We talked about mercy, but Luke is famous for his dealing with with uh, the theme of use of money and material possessions. It's yeah. really it's everywhere in his gospel, and in many cases, in stories you don't see parallels uh, in the other gospels. Um, one of my favorite stories is Zacchaeus, the uh, unjust tax collector who uh, travels up, you know, climbs up a sycamore tree to see Jesus on the road to uh, to Jericho, and and he sees Jesus, and. Jesus orders him down for the tree, and, and Zacchaeus is humble and repentant. So there's there's the theme of repentance there again, and he, he, Zacchaeus promises to pay back fourfold all the money that he had defrauded from other people. And and there's just so many examples in, in Luke's gospel that theme of of of, uh, of money and the use of material possessions. Yeah, I think too the workers in the vineyard. Yeah. Right. And in, in this particular case, yeah, right. In this particular case, it seems like the steward is being re rewarded because of this dilemma about the visitation of the master. And he's using that period of time to take advantage of this moment to disperse these possessions further and thereby 
in effect, gaining the acceptance. And that seems to be another theme, too, of the people that he's forgiven in terms of, of, of the money owed. But remember, uh, in, in much of the Bible, and, and Luke's gospel definitely supports this, is that the theme of debt forgiveness is very often used as a metaphor for the theme of forgiveness of sins. And, um, you know, indeed, Luke's, Luke's verse of the Lord's Prayer sometimes is translated, forgive us our debts as we forgive our, uh, our debtors. So, um, in other words, this idea of, of debt forgiveness uh, is closely linked to, to the theme of, of forgiveness of sins. And so there, there may be an aspect of that in there as well. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the idea of debt, uh, which even into modern times has had such a weight about it. I mean, yeah. debtor's prison was a very right grave reality for many people well into the 20th century in different parts of the world. Uh, and, and in fact, debt is still used today as a, a powerful form of control and domination. So it, again, it's, it's imagery that our Lord's audience uh, would have understood immediately, uh, but it's also imagery that's uh, remarkably timeless, uh, as of course are the deeper meanings of the parables that our Lord is trying to impart. Right. Okay, I want to get to one last thing, and uh, okay. Dr. Wood, I'll start with you. So um, how do we see the theme of mercy playing out in the stories of the cursed fig tree and the wicked tenants? Uh, that's good kind of an interesting uh, take on mercy, don't you think? These are in, uh, of course, Luke chapter 13 and Luke chapter 20, if anyone has their Bibles out and wants to look them up. Let me look them up. 13 and 20. 13 and 20, yes barren fig tree um yeah so this has to do with um let's see i have to refresh my memory on this one <laughs> if any well, of sure, you are the two yeah i was going to say i'll refresh everyone's memories actually because i think that the, the cursed fig tree in particular is one that people don't think about very often it's not a very popular parable uh for obvious reasons it says a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Lo, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should we use up the ground? And he answered him, Let it alone, sir, this year also, till I dig about it and put on manure. And if it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. It almost reminds me of that story of, of Abraham when, when he's trying to save, uh, what is, is it, Sodom and Gomorrah when he's trying to save them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he negotiates with God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll open it up to either you, Dr. Bunsen, or Dr. Brown. Do you either of you two have thoughts on this? Yeah, Pete, do you want to go ahead? What's interesting about this is that... Uh, you know, there's there's a pretty famous story in there's a version in both Matthew and Mark uh, where Jesus, on the way to entering the city of Jerusalem, curses the fig tree, and then they see the figs withered on it. And uh, I, that's a fascinating story, by the way, which I take as being sort of symbolic of Jesus's you know judgment against Jerusalem. In other words, there's not really so much a theme of mercy there, but the theme of sort of imminent. Um, judgment that's going to befall uh, the sort of locus of opposition to Jesus that's about to put him to death. But here uh, you get, in, there, uh, in, there's no version of that story in Luke, but instead we get the version of Jesus telling a parable about an accursed fig tree. In this case, uh, the fig tree is given a reprieve. He, you know, it, it didn't bear fruit at first, um, so he gets more time to, to, to bear it later. Uh, I was once told a story about this. Uh, there was there was a priest who, and the priest was the one who told the story. He said he was horrible as a priest. He was self-centered, egotistical. And one day this gospel reading came up, and he all of a sudden, you know, had this weird kind of vision right as he was going up to do the reading. And there was an argument between Jesus and Mary. And Jesus was saying, look, this dude is bearing no fruit as a priest. Uh, I, I want to take him away. And Mary said, no, 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 give him one more year, give him one more year, and he, he will bear fruit, I promise. And then that was the end of the story, and I, I don't know what happened to the priest, I guess he became a good priest after that, but, but there's the whole theme of, um, 
of, of kind of, uh, of of repentance there and and having a a, a reprieve. But notice this idea of uh, mercy and repentance. You know, repentance always has this this kind of a little bit of a dark background to it. That you know, you better do it, otherwise th there will be judgment following. And, and Jesus is quite careful to bring that up as well. A, a little bit before this parable, in fact, he tells the story of the Tower of Siloam that falls down on eighteen kind of random people who just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and. You know, everyone's saying, well, they must have had what's coming to them. They must have been really wicked. But Jesus says, no, 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 it's it's if they were any more wicked than anybody else. That could have happened to any of you. Um, and indeed, unless you repent, you too will perish. So there, there's a there's obviously, you know, the theme of the year of mercy. There's, you know, I, I like to joke that maybe next year will be a theme of judgment. I don't think that it'll happen. But <laughs> but um, you know, it would be fitting in a way if it were, because it, it really shows how the two themes really have to go together in, in some way to, to fully appreciate uh, the two of them. Yeah, and we can add, too, that it, it, this is very appropriate in the year of mercy, because uh, but Francis always uses that, that great image of no matter how many times you fall, uh, our Lord is waiting and ready to pick you up. And what I, what I love about this particular story, uh, obscure as it, as it seems to be, is the expertise of the vine dresser uh, that he says to him, let it alone, sir, this year also, until I dig about it and put on manure. And then he says, if it bears fruit next year. So he's purchasing time for this fig tree uh, to do better. And he, every opportunity then is there for us always to repent that we're not so far away uh, that we can't find our way back to the house to sort of close a circle on some of the parables, but also that we're not so barren uh, that we cannot bear fruit if we have the patience, but also if, if we allow ourselves uh, to be treated appropriately, uh, given that the balm of... Someone gets some manure in the room. Yes, yes, that, that if we have that chance, uh, we may bear fruit. And, and the, the, the things that might have come from this fig tree the following year could have been spectacular. Yes, there you go. That's right. Absolutely. I think that's a, a great way to, to wrap things up, actually. We're running out of time here. We only have a few minutes, and I have to get to the swag. I promised people okay. that there would be swag, and so I need to make sure that everyone who remained with us, and I know that they remained because this was such an interesting discussion, but just in case you want some CDU swag, uh, the what you need to do is go to the questions tab, and all you need to do is type in, I want CDU, I want CDU, and then uh, the the organizers of this webinar with, uh, with you Catholic, will um, be checking this out. I'm seeing all kinds of I want CDU typing in right now. It's awesome. Um, five, five lucky viewers will be picked at random, and you will win um, some CDU swag. And I understand, Dr. Bunsen, you have a couple of books that you're giving away as well? Yes, I'm giving away uh, three copies of my uh, biography of Pope Francis. Oh. Excellent, and it is an excellent biography. And, and, and I'll, I'll actually, I'll sign it, and it'll be worth something in about 400 years. Yes! <laughs> oh, man, sign me up. I need to sign in now. Um, but I actually, I already have a signed copy of your Pope Francis book, so I guess yeah. I'll, I'll leave it to others. But um, also, before we get going, I want to make sure that, that everyone knows that uh, Catholic Distance University is also working on a new website that will be up by the end of this week. It's Catholic distanceuniversity.com and I am assured that it will be up and running um, this coming www.cdu.edu Yes, cdu.edu is uh, yeah. where you can find they, This is what they told me Dr. Okay, Brown okay. is that catholicdistanceuniversity.com okay. is another website that will be up and running yeah. um, later this week but of course you can go to cdu.edu get more information about Catholic Distance University and the wonderful programs that they have available. And um, just want to invite everyone also to tune in to the Sunrise Morning Show. Um, yes, I'll please. Be with you. <laughs> I'll be with you at 6 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow morning on EWTN's Global Catholic Radio Network. Um, but you can also, if you don't have Catholic Radio in your, Catholic Radio in your area, download the Sunrise Morning Show app. 
Um, if you go to sonrisemorningshow.com, you can find out details there. Um, but I look forward to uh, talking to many of you tomorrow on the Sunrise Morning Show. Um, Dr. Wood, Dr. Bunsen, Dr. Brown, this has been a really, really wonderful and enlightening hour or so that we've had with you. So thank you so much for your time um, this evening. Great to be with you. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. I was wondering let's do it again if, uh, sometime. Yes, let's please yes. do. Um, I was wondering if you all would join me um, to close it out with um, the Hail Holy Queen in the name of the sure. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, O most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us, and after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you so much again to our panel, and thank you so much to everyone listening. Good luck in winning the swag, and uh, we'll look forward to having you back again sometime soon. God bless. Thanks for turning in.